Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to Glitch Bottle, the podcast where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. I'm your host, Alexander F., and today we are so excited to discuss how to consort with spirits, with practicing magician, author, and strategic sorcerer, Jason Miller. And you might be wondering, listeners out there, what is a spirit? What does it mean to have a relationship with a spirit? What are the different models of esoteric engagement? When is something like friendly conjuration called for versus a stronger approach in ritual? Well, Jason Miller is one of the best people to ask on these topics. And Jason's latest tome, Consorting with Spirits, covers these topics and so much more in incredible depth. And so Jason today is returning on the podcast to go deep into magical systems, deepening connections with spirits, what a relationship actually means. And also Jason is answering your amazing Glitch Bottle Patreon listener questions. So thanks to each and every patron of the podcast for asking Jason so many awesome questions. Jason, as I know many listeners know, has devoted more than 30 years to studying magical practice and engagement in so many forms, and he's the author of several other tomes of magical insight as well, including Protection and Reversal Magic, Financial Sorcery, and so many others. And so now to help us uncork the uncommon, let's welcome Jason Miller. Jason, thank you so much for, again, returning on the uh, podcast. Really appreciate your time. Oh, thank you for having me. I, it, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on again. Well, it, 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 the, the honor is always mine, Jason, and I, I, I try not to speak for the listeners, but I, I'm sure they feel the same way. Uh, and your latest tome, Jason, is called Consorting with the Spirits. Um, And one of the first things that you stress about this book is how intentional you are with the title and specifically the use of the word consorting. Can you you share with the listeners about why is that word so important uh, regarding this topic? Yeah, you know, um, this is the first time I have ever insisted on a title. Uh, I, I let New Page or Wiser now generally pick a title. And it probably shouldn't have, but, you know, uh, early on, I just said, you guys handle that. And uh, But this time I was really like, I want this to be the title because it's got a dual meaning. So first, it is the title of a crime that you could have been charged with in England in the 1600s. Uh, you were consorting with spirits if you were doing what we do. And so... I just wanted to pay a little nod to the fact that, uh, yes, a lot of people who were just innocent women and and, and, and men uh, got caught up in politics and in, in local scares that maybe had no real esoteric practice at all. But at the same time, we also know from recipe books and, and, and manuals that people were consorting with spirits. Um, at the risk of imprisonment and and their own lot, you know, and and death. So it was important. It's, it's, they, they took that risk. And that's something that um, in this risk averse world, people are, are really like, well, how do I know it's completely safe? Nothing is ever completely safe. So it's risky. Uh, The other aspect to this is that consorting implies an ongoing relationship, right? Like, Like if you meet someone disreputable, right? Like if you meet Tony Soprano, you're not consorting with the mob. You've just, you know, you've met a mobster. If, however, you're hanging out at the, you know, at the Italian butcher where the guys all hang out and you know them all on first name basis because you're there all the time, you're consorting, you know, and and that's the definitions of consorting in the dictionary. They also add this little bit of, you know, an ongoing relationship with disreputable people or, or, or beings that are not well thought of. And so... It's that idea that 
hey, you're doing something that society frowns upon and you're not just doing it once. You're building a life around it. You're integrating this into who you are and your life and your relationships. And those relationships are really important. They're kind of what separate the real witches, magicians, sorcerers from the folks that are like, I'm going to crack open a book and take a stab at this. So thus consorting with spirits. And two, Jason, you know, you mentioned that exactly. There's this kind of risk aversion that's going on and it's been going on for years. I know, you know, I went years ago when I first picked up grimoires, I was thinking, oh, well, let me just calculate everything perfectly until I can jump in and, and just how, how detrimental that is. And you mentioned in the book as well that when it comes down to it, the best sorcery is local. And can you just talk about that word local and just what that means in this context, especially since, as you touched on in today's day and age, so many people are obsessed with having kind of universal systems of magic, that everything fits into neat little correspondencies in, in some areas. Yeah. You know, um, so I think of it this way. If you want to get uh, a great latte, who is it better to forge a relationship? The, the person at the local coffee shop or the CEO of Starbucks, right? Uh, or, or even the regional manager, right? If you want to get your deliveries on time and not broken, is it better for you to know Jeff Bezos or is it better for you to have a, con you know, to occasionally tip your UPS FedEx guy. Um, so it's local. It's, you know, it's, it's the, all sorcery is local in a way, because even if you did contact the CEO, it just, it has to filter down and it gets carried out by some local guy anyway. So the best of all worlds is to carry the authority that comes with having that connection at the top but also having a friendly relationship at the bottom. Too many people are just concerned with the top, with the big names. And for the longest time, I remember the first time I ever let a, a spirit feast ritual be published. It was in a, a magazine called Bahutet out of Philadelphia, out of the OTO in, in Philly. And uh, a couple people said, well, this sort of flies in the face of that anti-spiritualist stance that we ceremonial magicians have. Like, you're just getting anything. You know, you're, you're, you're making contact with whatever is around the corner. Like, isn't that dangerous? And I said, let's, let's unpack this, right? Like, let, let's really seriously think about this instead of just repeating the old chestnut over and over. And let's use people as an example. I, I could have easily called this book, It's Just Like With People, because every example comes back down to, how do we do this with people? And so you move into an area, what kind of person are you? Do you want to get, do you get to know your neighbors? Do you get to know the people in the area? Or do you buy a who's who and only ever allow yourself to contact the most important people, the most well-known people? Um, and then, you know, on the other side of that, it turns out that if you, you know, crack open the books of the well-known spirits, they're not safe. <laughs> like there's nothing safe about these. Some of them are quite dangerous and even the angels are not terribly safe. So it's kind of like, like, what are you afraid of? Well, you could get anything around the corner that could lie to you. Anything can lie. To you. Like any, you know, you've got, there's no guarantees. It's just like with people. So that's why I say, you know, Look, you, you want to get to local, to the locals. And very often, even when people think they're dealing with a god or, or uh, you know, an angel or a spirit, they wind up dealing with a local. Uh, it could be that the choirs of angels under the archangel or the legions of demons under the, the well-known, you know, demon with a office and a title. 
Um, or it could be what I call the mall Santa phenomenon, right? Which is like a local being who is more manifest. This is really what we're talking about. Like well-known gods like Jupiter. They're, they're, they're so vast um, and, and they are powerful, but they're not like, you can't point to them in a room. You, when you invoke them, you feel their presence. But you really have to like go to extreme lengths to get them to the point where you can point to them in a room, right? It's it's a, that's like full forceful evocation and often not comfortable, right? So what do they do? They have mall Santas, and and the idea behind the mall Santa is pretty simple. Like by the time kids are four or five, they realize that the guy at the mall isn't Santa. He works for Santa. Right. Like Santa's, of course, real kids. So the guy at the mall works for Santa, which is why he looks different in every mall. And, you know, they know Santa's busy with managing the elves and everything. So they tell they treat him like he's Santa. They tell him what they want. And then at night he delivers the message up to the big guy. Uh, I think this was played out really well by Macaulay Culkin in Home Alone, where he corners the the Santa after the fact. He's like getting into his car. And, um, but yeah, that's, you know, sometimes that's exactly what you're dealing with. And this is, I would, you know, when I was writing the book, I was bouncing some ideas around with BJ Swain. And he's like, you know, this is really actually a well-documented thing in history too, that local beings will speak for the gods and so on. So. Yeah. Local. It's all local. And that's such a refreshing perspective because it really challenges you to look in your situation and your environment and and the rituals that you're engaged in. And what I love about that too, Jason, in your book, Consorting with Spirits, is against this backdrop of locality and relationship and consorting, you frame most, most of the rituals in the book, as you say, with three main strains, if you will, three main traditions, like yeah. Christianity, paganism, and Luciferianism. Can you share with the listeners, especially someone like yourself, who you know, you've, you've explored so many traditions in, in your 30 plus years of experience in esotericism, why these three traditions specifically to frame most of the rituals? Well, you know, they cover, um, they cover a, a gambit. So at the, at the moment, especially when we're talking about conjuring, right? When we're talking about evoking and conjuring with circles and, 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 and so on, there's a lot of interest. And in, in, see, in my head, I presented it as three, but in my head, it's really two positions. So, because I have sort of a Christio diabolic view, as you, as you know, from, from looking at some of the Cyprianic stuff. Um, but it matters how you approach it, right? So, let's, you know, in the book, I focus on the, the demons in the Ars Goetia, but it could be, you know, I, I also talk about uh, demons from the, the uh, Grimoire Verum, but it could also be an angel or something like that. The power that you're drawing the authority from, you have to think of it in relation to the being and then how the whole rest of it works. So there's a lot of people out there. They want, they want, the demons of the Ars Goetia, because as far as I can tell, because the seals look cool, they're, they're just bitching. They're really awesome. Kind of the same way that like, you know, the way the seal for Lucifer in Asia has become the seal of Lucifer. Boom. Why? Because it just, it looks cooler than the seal of Lucifer in Europe. It's easier to draw. It's more geometrical. It's a good logo. The other one just kind of sucks. So whether you think that Lucifer took this and is like, actually, that's the real one that I hid in there. Or if Lucifer was like, hey, I like that one. Let's go with it. You know, you, you humans came up with it. Let's roll with that one. Or if people were just like, it just looks cooler. And so it's now blossomed into the thing. But you got to think about how those spirits are in relation. So 
traditional grimoire work, you're approaching it through a Christian lens, right? You're, you're approaching God and you're calling these spirits in the name of God and the Madonna and, and the Savior and the angels. And so what are you doing? You're using the opposing army. You're using the antagonistic army, the one that's like, I'm, I'm getting the enemy who I am, I, you know, I am ruling over because I've won the battle uh, and I'm forcing them to appear. Right. Like I'm I am I am calling them by these powers. And then you could argue that those seals function within that view, like maybe those seals are the seals of that bind those spirits under those powers. And then once you change those powers out, maybe those seals don't work the same or at all. Something to consider. So now let's flip it around to the Luciferian angle, because there's just a lot of Luciferians and Satanists and, and, and things like that out there of every shade. And you know, sometimes there's, I'm not a left-hand path person. There's some corners of that world that I really detest. And there's some corners of that world that very fine, perfectly nice people um, and, and solid thinking in, in, in some ways. So uh, let's take a look at that. And then, okay, well, how does it work? Because now we're not calling upon that spirit with the opposing army. We're talking to the boss. Like we're conjuring it under the boss who is friendly on the same side as those demons. So the conjuration has to change a little bit. You can't just rip the names out and throw the new names in. Now let's remove it from that Christian worldview entirely. There is no God. There is no devil. There's just these spirits. And let's conjure them under the power of Hecate. And, you know, as, as BJ had pointed out in uh, Living Spirits that, you know, Hecate works her way into Christian demonology. Certainly a lot of what we know about later Hecate and Thurgy comes from Michael Sellis, the Byzantine demon, demonologist. Um, and so Hecate is, and, and there are talismans with Hecate on one side and Solomon on the other. Like, I don't mean new ones. I mean, you know, in antiquity. Um, so Hecate is just sort of like, you know, here's an important pagan figure, uh, but could also model how some other pagan relation figure that you have a relationship might work. So now the whole thing is different. Maybe the circle is different. Maybe we're not calling the four kings anymore. And, and in the book, I say, let's call the winds and rivers instead. Because those four kings aren't, don't necessarily respond with Hecate at the center in the same way. Um, and so the whole dynamics change because now you're calling it from a, a pagan figure on the outside. But people, I don't know, they seem to have this attitude like all you really need to do is just rip out the names you don't like and throw in the names you do like. And it's not really that way because there's more to it than that. Like these are well-constructed rituals that have a consistency. And if you switch one part out, it changes the whole thing. Uh, and this is true for everything. You know, one of the things that, that I've, I've always been flummoxed by with, um, say, like the Thelemic Gnostic Church, right? is like, you know, yes, we can go and we have the apostolic secession that goes all the way back to, to, to Christ. Like, okay, but you don't invoke Christ or call upon Christ in your rituals. So why do you even care about that? Like, it doesn't matter. And do you? Because you're not doing it in that name anyway. You've got the, you know, the person to person, but you're no longer operating like that's like me saying, well, I'm going to give Hecate empowerments because I have tantric empowerments that go all the way back to Padmasambhava, which I do. But 
that doesn't mean anything in, in relationship to Hecate. So who gives it? Who cares? Right? Like it's, it's irrelevant in that context. So um, people need to figure out the relevancy and, and, you know, and, and work with it that way. Jason, that it flows directly into this next concept that you touch on in your book, because as you mentioned, you have these various tributaries and sometimes people can get tangled by focusing perhaps a little bit too much on the model of spirits. And you tell, you know, this has been going on for years, the psychological model versus the spirit-based model versus the energy model, the resonance model. And you make such an interesting argument in the book. You say that the model quote should not be meta, but a mega model. Can you just define those two terms and, and, and really help listeners understand about what is a mega spiritual model uh, for esotericism? So, so, um, it's, it's funny because I've been saying this for like over a decade since, since back when the blogosphere was alive with the, you know, what is America's next top model of magic? Um, and, and people were just hunkered down into these things. And I'm like, this is a, like, this entire conversation is just stupid. So I go back to, to um, Frater UD, who, whose writings I respect and who wrote a, a nice little pithy piece um, on the models of magic. And he lays out four and then a quasi fifth model of how magic works. So he's got spirits as like the old model. Magic is worked through spirits, right? And then somewhere probably around the time that we started messing around with radio and, uh, and, and electricity, we started to think, oh, well, maybe energy is how magic works. But also if we start to look at magic in the East, that fits a lot better. Like the translators were already using energy for a lot of the functions of spirits in Eastern models of magic, because, you know, you're, you're, I mean, visualizing tetrahedrons in your body that get filled up with a rain of energy. It sounds like something Drunvalo Melchizedek pulled out of his butt. But really, it's, I mean, this is, this, that practice is a purification ritual from Naguma. It was over a thousand years old. So then you've got, so you've got the energy, quote, model. And then you've got around, again, the time of psychoanalysis and, and Jung and, and whatnot, the mind model. Well, maybe this is all the powers of the mind. And this has the benefit of all sounding much more sciencey than spirits, right? It's much, it, it's much, much less superstitious than spirits. Um, and then as we start to come into the computer age and the information age, we start to think in terms of the information model. Um, and so we have this idea that, well, it's maybe it's not your mind. It's just that there's information. There's a mental uh, model where uh, Patrick Dunn encapsulates this really nicely, that, that the information model is talking to the universe in a way that the universe understands and responds. So this kind of explains sympathetic magic really nicely, right? Um, and it also explains why some things that are probably not intrinsically true, right? Like, I don't think that kids in India who draw like a hexagram as part of a yantra are invoking or banishing a planet based on the golden dogs. Yet, it's also not just what you think about it, because I have met people who've done the wrong hexagram and accidentally invoked that planet. So there's, there's, a, there's an information there that is beyond the personal mind but within the tradition that they're working in. So the stream of information. So what, what Frater UD says is he's like, you know, well, we've got these four different models of magic. And 
but they all seem true because everybody that is able to work magic with them. So what we need, and uh, you know, in his mind, and, and and in the mind of the '90s chaos magician, right? We need a meta model because chaos magicians and the '90s in general, like anything you can do, I can do meta. That's that, and like we, they love it and. Only the only thing you love better than meta is quantum. So it's it's like, you know, all magic is in a quantum state like Schrodinger's cat until you decide on the model. And then that's the model that's true. And so I'm I, you know, and then I get to this and I was like, well, it's sort of a brilliant breakdown of of four ways that magic works. And then when you get to the meta, the whole thing just becomes incredibly stupid. In the way that if we get into a car and I'm like, well, I believe that the car runs on gasoline and you believe that the car runs on electricity and BJ believes that the car runs purely on mechanics and, you know, I don't know, just somebody else believes that the car runs on, uh, you know, oil. Well, then really what's happening is the car runs on that thing based upon who is driving, right? Like that's the meta model. That's dumb, right? Like the car doesn't really give a crap what you believe. The car uses all of these things because they each have a different purpose. And so if you look at these four models of magic and you stop treating them as models of magic and start treating them as forces of magic or ways that, or, or not, even, not even that magic is one thing, just these are four different ways of causing change that fit under the umbrella of magic then all of a sudden it becomes much clearer because you can see that there are spirits, which then explains why very often things, spirits behave in ways that are not expected or can do things that clearly are not just part of your mind. And, but that very often, what spirits tell people winds up being like, okay, you know, the spirit said to lift my foot and close my left eye to shift bodily energy or, you know, when their, their hands get hot or when they're focusing, they find that their focus affects a conjuration or a spell. Um, or why is it that sympathetic magic also works if the spirit model is just all that there is like, you know, why do does the Venetian textbook exist where you're doing essentially folk magic, but with the demons of the, the Grimoire Verum? Well, because you're taking that spirit from the Grimoire Verum and you, you who are also a spirit is investing your mind and your energy and your focus into it. And then you're doing some kind of sympathetic magic, like dropping coins with clown X seal on it into a bank that gives then the energy and mind of the spirit something to latch on to that's material speaks to the information model. So that's the mega model. Like stop looking at for some clever single feature for all of magic to work because, or for that matter, for even just spirits to work because the, the thing is all of our models in magic, in religion, they're all too tidy. They're, they're not tidy enough to explain the physical world that we live in and all agree upon as real. So they're definitely uh, not complex enough to explain a subtle reality. But because magic doesn't get challenged in the way that physical findings do, we just basically decide to believe something and then defend it and it, like it's a fact when it's not a fact. 
there's nothing less sciencey than things that are done with the methods of science, but the aim of religion. Like I've never seen worse science in my life. Jason, you bring up such a fascinating point in terms of, of recognizing that you need to break some of these long held habits, long held paradigms. And, and one of those things, and we've discussed this before in the past is there are some uh, say ceremonial magicians out there who might say, listen, when you, evoke a spirit successfully, you must have a manifestation to full visible appearance. And I'm, I'm taking one side of the spectrum, you know, just yeah. to make a point, but you say in the book that quote, simple resonance, simple resonance is the most commonplace manifestation of a spirit's influence in your life. It accounts, you say, for probably 80% of magic. Even in some classical grimoires that focus on making spirits appear, active resonance is all that is sought, unquote. What is magical resonance, and what, what do you want ma magicians to keep in mind if they've been practicing for years or if they're just starting out? Sure. So, you know, I mean, sometimes... Um, and, and when I say this, I'm actually not talking about any of the authors or the notables out there uh, when I offer this critique. They know the books, like they know, but I think sometimes the people that are just out there because like they've decided that they're Solomonic or, or whatever their grimoire is and they're walking around like Musashi to prove that they're the best and everything else sucks and like, they don't they don't even pay attention to the fact that, well, you know, there's natural magic um, that's explained in those very books and sympathetic that magic that's given in those books. Um, and that you in most of those books, you go through this long ceremony and you're you are getting this face to face full appearance. And what is the first thing that you do? You want to set up something easier so you don't have to do that all the time, right? So it's like this, you know, how did we set up this call, right? We used Facebook Messenger. Um, so the attitude would be like, well, it's not really talking with Andrew or Jason unless we are in the room together. And it's like, well... No, like we can do Zoom, but then we don't even have to do Zoom for some things. We just use Messenger for some things, right? So if you are like, this is why you get, you get people doing like three hour ceremonies to do something that like a folk magician could do in a few minutes or, or a root worker could do without, you know, yeah, let's, let's make this happen. Uh, or, or frankly, ordinary people can do with just a little effort um, and, and, you know, like a little effort and charm. And, you know, the, the ceremonial magician is like, you know, no, I must evoke Orobas to full appearance to ask it to, you know, help me get a promotion at work. It's it's weary. It's it's, you know, the spirits, everything we know. From historical records, the spirits don't particularly love to be evoked that way. Um, so why do we think that this is the best? What, like, why are we breaking reality for ordinary crap? Um, and so what is resonance? Resonance is when you're doing some kind of magic and you attract the power of the spirit. You, you've, you've attracted maybe not even the full attention of the spirit. You've just set up a resonance with that spirit in a way that brings its power into whatever you're doing through a song, through, you know, and the thing is, the killer is the evocations themselves as acts of magic. I mean, the calls of conjuration are themselves done through resonance, right? Like if you are calling a spirit in the name of Sabao, in the name of, and, and, you know, this saint and that saint, they're not being evoked to full appearance, right? So you're using that resonance already. 
Um, you know, in, in the Bible, um, Christ is, is walking and uh, a Gentile woman who's sick touches the hem of his garment. And he stops and he notices that like he has power has drained from him. He didn't, he didn't heal her. She just grabbed the hem of his garment and was healed. And he then says, go forth in faith. But the scripture is very clear. He didn't stop and then is like, I now heal you. No, it was all automatic resonance like she just grabbed the hem of his garment so you know if you are doing a, a piece of sympathetic magic you don't need to conjure the archangel into full appearance you can call it through a novena or through prayers or through evocations or through chanting and get that resonance and then what what Unfortunately, what people kind of with that like one trick pony view of evocation see is like, oh, this idiot thinks he can just call the name of the archangel and it's the same as my intense ceremonially. Well, no, he doesn't think it's the same. You just think that's the only way magic can happen. And you're wrong. <laughs> like, so it's... Um, yeah. So you've got resonance, you've got full evocation, and you've got other things in between. When people visualize the archangels and then call upon the archangels to take up resonance in those visualizations, that's not an evocation. The, I don't even think the archangels are in any way like consciously aware of it happening. But your the strength of your visualization Note your power, your informa your information, the, the the power, the energy. Perhaps when when people chant the name and they feel that bodily responsive energy, it's like Tai Chi. Uh, so there's a bodily energy there that that's fed into it, and then that attracts the resonance. And so there's all these levels of manifestation that spirits can make. Um, that all get handled differently and magic can be done at all of them. And, and often the most powerful or the most intense is not the most effective for any given situation. I mean, certainly the most intense way to contact me is to like walk up to me in the street and say, hi, are you Jason? I, you know, but if I don't know who you are, my answer is no, you have the wrong person. Like it's happened and just flat. Nope. I'm not that guy. I, I have no idea who you are unless I'm alone or something like that. But, but like if I'm out with family or something, I'm like, nope. And so, yeah, the most intense is not always the best. The best is the best. That's, that's wonderful advice. And speaking of that, Jason, you mentioned just broadly speaking that there are two kind of main groups of people out there and many listeners might find themselves in one group or in another or somewhere in between. And you mentioned that there are those who are prone to psychic experiences after a ritual, they report everything during a ritual, maybe with scrying. And there are those who are not prone to uh, psychic experiences or those direct feedback uh, experiences during ritual. And you mentioned that both of those groups have work to do uh, in, yeah. in various areas. So if someone's listening and they might find themselves in one of those groups, what is the work for each group that you'd recommend that they take a look at? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, the two groups are sort of extremes. So hopefully most people are in the middle somewhere. But um, but people do tend to drift towards extremes sometimes and, and more and more so these days. But I think what happens, especially in online culture, is people, they get onto a group and they have some modest spiritual experiences, right? Like they do a spell and the spell works out and they, you know, they felt something or they received a message or they had a dream or 
an inspiration or they performed an evocation of a spirit and they saw a face and they then they felt a response, but they didn't have a conversation that was like up to their standards. And then they get online. And then, you know, somebody is like, oh, well, you know, I just said Papa Legba three times. And then Papa Legba showed up and told me that I am, you know, his child and that I should go. And and so then people start measuring their experience by these other people who have these like phantasmagoric shows every time they close their eyes. And I'm one of those people that, that like, I, you know, I do a piece of magic, I'll get something, right? Um, and that, at first, when I was younger, that was like a badge of like, yeah, you know, I, I can walk away. If I'm at an open circle, I'm, and then we everyone's sharing, I'm going to have something to share because I, I definitely saw something. But here's the thing. You, the first thing to do is if you're in that camp, of I see stuff easily, I feel stuff easily. Your work is discernment. It's discernment. Like realize that every experience you've ever had, even watching this podcast, is a mixture of projection and perception. Like you're perceiving it accurately to some degree and you're projecting a little bit upon it as well. Um, and every experience you've ever had is a mix of this. The moment it, that it's passed, you've, you've projected all kinds of stuff onto it. Well, subtle experiences, not surprising, are even more prone to this kind of thing. So your work is to improve that ratio. Your work is to cut through those easy to get surface level things where maybe there's a spark of a spirit contact. And then your mind just goes, we, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to roll with this, but, you know, and I think it's good to roll with things when they're happening, but afterwards you should look and say, what was actionable? Like, what, was there anything here that's for me to do that's useful and that makes any kind of sense, or at least isn't terribly dangerous? Is there anything meaningful here that, that gives me a context for, uh, for framing, for use, for, for, for feeling better about something, for even just a thumbs up, like your work is going really well? Um, then cool. But if not, then just let it go. You don't have to judge it as false. It's, you don't have to judge it at all because it's irrelevant just let it go. Just don't make it a thing. It's a thing that happened. The most powerful things that a magician can learn are the phrases, well, that happened, because you don't have to do anything with it. It's just, it was a thing that happened. Uh, and, it, and you don't need to make it a big deal. You don't need to boost your ego. You don't need to think that you're great. You don't need to think that you're bad. It was just, let it go. Like, like something that happens in a meditation. Now, on the other side of the coin, uh, people that are that are head blind or they they are tr have trouble with experiences. There's a bunch of different spirit skills in the book, and then there's a bunch of different things in other books of mind and other people's exercises that you can do. Um, but some of the like some of the best things to do are are two things that you can just integrate into your regular life. One, recapture some idle time because humans need idle time to just not do anything, to be bored, to let the mind wander, go for a walk without a podcast, without any distractions, mow the lawn, um, these kinds of things. Don't meditate. This isn't about focusing the mind. It's just about letting the mind be, because that's when you build connections, right? That's when you build connections in the mind, it's when you are open, when you can receive things. So adding a little bit of that time and space builds those muscles. And unfortunately, in 2007, we killed what little idle time we had left with cell phones, with, with smartphones, right? Like 
we no longer even are bored waiting in line for something. We've, we've got something to occupy every moment of every day. And it's not good for you. And as a, as a person who wants to talk to spirits, it's particularly not good for you. Um, the other thing that I would say is cut yourself a little break and learn to do what the other folks do. Like, when it's happening, just go on the roller coaster ride. Engage. If you get an I like, let's say that you've evoked, I don't know, you know, malpas, and you see like a bird fly off. What generally happens is the people who are headlined think that was just my mind because I know somewhere that malpas is associated with birds. So that I that's just a brain fart. I'm going to sit and wait until Malthus really shows up and like grabs me by the nuts in a way that I can't deny. Well, unfortunately, that bird might have been Malthus going like, hey, you know, you don't you're oriented to the physical and I'm trying to get through to you. And I got this little bit through and you said, fuck off. So don't do that. Engage in it. And yeah, it might be a brain fart. But again, Afterwards, re- review it afterwards with criti- with 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 self critique. Engage in it while it's going. Um, and here's the beauty: let's say that you engage with it while it's going, and you get something that is useful and uh, in some way, shape, or form that that helps you say frame or think differently about an issue that's vexing you, or or even an idea for a spell right? Like a a thing to do with Malthus's seal, for instance. Uh, For me, a lot of the spirits of the Ars Goetia, one of the reasons I love working with them is that all the time they give me spells related to their seals. So it's like, okay, you've got this. And then people will think, well, that's probably just me. But again, who cares? Was it actionable? Does it make sense? Give it a try. Um, stop trying. It, you're, it's like you're riding a bike. That moment where you're riding and you say, am I, am I riding a bike? You fall over because you're not engaging it enough to get any kind of momentum. So there are all kinds of other spirit skill tricks and, and, and tips and practices, both little things you could do in the moment and long practices that build over time. But in the end, you know, a little bit of idle time and a little bit of like engaging imaginative play to lead you somewhere to sh- and shut down that critic in the moment, really powerful stuff. And Jason as well, you, one of the themes that you really mention in the book that is kind of pervasive is exactly you know, allowing yourself loosen the grip on your day-to-day reality, be open, be receptive. And really it's about paying attention. One of the themes that you talk about. And to that point, Jason, we have uh, many listener questions for you. And and one of them is from uh, patron Alex Brock Art, who is asking how prevalent Jason, or how often are things like intuition, feelings, emotion, or even ideas influenced by spirits? And if so, How can one start to parse out what's in one's own mind versus the influence of the spirit? Is there a reason, Jason, most of society does not perceive spirits? So we don't perceive. So first of all, we are spirits. We're organized around physical bodies. So you perceive spirits every day that are organized in physical bodies, human, animal, trees, everything else. But I get what you mean. You mean, why are we not perceiving ghosts and and nymphs and and so on? And the reason is that they're organized not around physical bodies. So they're oriented. Our perception is oriented towards the physical. Their perception is oriented towards etheric or astral or even uh, vast mental spaces that, that aren't spatial in the way that we think of them. So 
Um, you know, I, I, I was just having a conversation where somebody said, you know, it's funny that you make that you reject Platonism because you do have this sort of layered, like under this is that and under this is that. And I'm like, yes, but I don't believe that one rules the other. I don't believe that there's like a perfection and then everything else is like degrees of suckage. Um, so I don't like, I just like, I don't think my bones are inherently better than my skin. It's, you know, they're just, they're layers. So, uh, you know, I believe in layers. I just don't think that there's any kind of divine betterness about one layer over another. But um, so, but we are oriented to these different layers. And of course, uh, a lot of cultures think that ideas do come from spirits or that ideas are spirits. You know, the, 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 the genius, the, the idea of the genius is the idea of a spirit. Um, and this is not particularly a cult. I think one of the, the best modern explanations of it was from the book Big Magic by uh, E. Pray Love, Elizabeth Gilbert. She writes about how she had like this very, very specific idea. And then another writer had very, very specific idea at more or less the same time. And there's no way they could have overlapped. Um, the movie 28 Days Later what this was written at around the same time that the comic book, The Grateful, the, the Grateful Dead, The Walking Dead was written. Both of them start out with somebody waking up from a coma in a zombie apocalypse. They didn't know each other. This was not an idea that was passed around. It was an idea that was just out there in the information, in the, in the free floating. So, you know... There is a level to which, because we are not islands, that our ideas may not be our own. But when it comes to, say, summoning a spirit, and sometimes a spirit will filter very close to the physical and you'll hear it like a physical voice. And that's that's cool when it happens and it's great. Um but other times spirits will speak in uh, ideas and sometimes spirits will speak in sort of a twisted symbolic language, depends on the type of spirit and your ability to communicate. The best way to separate is to meditate. Uh, now, this is not the idle time. This is actually sitting, focusing on breath or, or, or some other single pointed focus. And then you become distracted and you return to it. Why is that the best training? Because it's not that meditation will open you up to some clarity and, and higher level of, of thinking, although it can and does if you continue with it. But when people, what I'm talking about is the stuff that makes people think that they're bad at meditation. I sit down and I just get distracted. Yeah, that's meditation. Like sitting down and then like focusing on the breath for about three seconds before you think about porn is, is meditation. And then recognizing that you're thinking about porn and returning to the breath is re recognizing the texture of your own mind and taking control over it and going back to it. So, once you get that and you get a feel for what the fabric of your own thoughts is like, it's actually very easy to start recognizing when something comes in that's not, that doesn't have that texture, that doesn't feel that way. Um, so that's sort of the best thing to do. That is such great wisdom. I, I definitely hope that the listeners appreciate that as much as I do, because I know that was one of the things I struggled with early on and that allowing yourself that forgiveness, it's okay. It's supposed to happen. You're supposed to get distracted. You're supposed to learn about that. And I think, Jason, that meditation is one of the many foundational aspects that you touch on in your book, Consorting with Spirits, that I think people you know, will really enjoy. And to that point, we actually have another uh, foundational aspect that you discuss, and we have a listener question for you from patron Tom MacArthur. And Tom is saying and asking, in the book, Jason, you mentioned confession as an effective form of purification. 
but you don't spend much time on it and suggest that it's okay to skip if need be. On the other hand, Tom says, Jake Stratton Kent and others stress it as an essential step of conjuration. Do you, Jason, think an oath and confession should ideally be a part of every ritual? Is another form of purification just as good? And what's your experience, Jason, of conjuring with versus without confession as part of a ritual? Uh, Yeah, so I'm not enormously into confession uh, as a purification method. So here's the thing. Uh, about purification. So when we purify, we sublimate, right? We become more sublime. We become closer to uh, the spirit and we become less burdened by some of the physical things. Um, in a in sort of a classical Christian context where we might be setting up a battle with a demon, then of course, you know, if we know that we are, you know, our soul is clean, then, then the demon can't have anything over us or anything like that, which, um, you know, just, I don't know, like look around at Catholics that go to confession regularly. Do they seem unburdened by sin? Not to me. Um, so what's the practical effect? Like I know what it's supposed to be, but look around. Like, that's always my thing. Like, yeah, I know that this is supposed to create adepts who are like better than ordinary people, but look around. Like, does this seem like better than ordinary people or does this seem like you might be better off having like, you know, random people from the local church watch your kids? Like, so it's, it's, it's that kind of thing. Like I'm always like, look around at what it really does in practice, not what it's supposed to do. Um, that said, you know, confession is, is also, uh, 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 is recognized the world over and purification is, but then there are energetic purifications. So for instance, in, uh, in Tantra, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm guilty of taking a lot of things that I've learned in Tantra and applying them to the wider world of magic. I don't even like the term Western magic because I'm always like, like, are we really just making this line between Turkey and Greece and pretending that the entire world somehow is different on the other side? I think it's stupid. So, but I am guilty of taking concepts that work that are just that that are functional um, and applying them to other magic, which is functional because I'm more concerned with authenticity of function than I am authenticity of tradition or history, right? Like those are fine if those are your concerns, but I'm more interested in authenticity of function. So uh, within Tantra, there are rituals that, where you would confess and, and you would, you know, you would list things that, that, that you know, are, are vow breakages and so on. But then there are also rituals that veer closer to inner Tantra and, and Dzogchen. One of my favorite is, you know, the characteristics of confession and what must be confessed are liberated within their own place. And thus, you know, the mandala of confession is naturally and spontaneously accomplished. Ah, and you sound the syllable ah because it's the natural sound of, of the, you don't make, it, it's said to be the natural state because if you just vibrate your vocal cords without making any other sounds with your mouth, you get ah. Uh. And so you're just recognizing that everything that you do uh, is a manifestation of your attachments and therefore something that you could confess, but really, you know, underneath. Uh, then there's energetic confessions where they visualize a deity above their heads and then they even more sublime deities above them. And then they filter down. And then you literally see your body as you chant a hundred syllable mantra, get filled up and you see the blackness pour out and, and so on. So there are energetic practices I do to sublimate uh, and, 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 um, and purify. 
Um, so I'm not that big into confession. I just, it feels to me like kind of fake. Um, and I, I'm not big into the fakes. I always feel like more of a, like a spirit would call me out on being a big faker than, than anything else. I'd rather just be okay with things that I do. Um, I remember once, this is a weird thing to relate to confession, but, but seriously, I remember once I get this like email with like an old password from like that I hadn't used in 10 years. And, and it was like one of those extortion emails, like, this is your password. We have videos of you doing nasty things in front of your computer. You know, the idea being that, you know, I'm like, and I looked at it and I was like, <laughs> like me, you and everybody else, buddy, like knock yourself out. Like, uh, and, and it was just like, okay, so how does this relate to confession? Because if a demon is like, I know the evil thoughts that you have. Yeah, me too. Like, sure. Absolutely. Thoughts about, you know, like, like just horrible things. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. But, you know, I try not to do them. And when I, you know, if I do have acted on them and paid the price and, you know, sat with it and dealt with it and, you know, I'm good. Like that to me is confession. I don't need um, having someone else say that I'm forgiven has never helped me really be okay with any of that. Whereas dealing with it does. And I think we have, I think we have better tools, even in modern day common life not magical spiritual life, just common life. I think we have better tools than, than the people who wrote the grimoires had. And I think not using those tools because they didn't exist when the grimoire was written is silly. And Jason, to that point, in terms of revisiting those, you know, quote unquote, more traditional tools, uh, we do have a listener question for you from, patron lucid themes who is asking a quote fasting and purification are noted to be necessary for large operations like an evocation but for general offering rituals do you think any sort of purity is needed so it's you know for general offering rituals no because you're you're well so first of all i shouldn't say no because what the way that I teach magic is that people will develop a regular practice and that regular practice will contain purification elements. And so in a way you are constantly in a state of purifying. So the whole model of magic of like, Hey, I'm an ordinary guy doing ordinary stuff. And now I want to talk to this demon. So I better get holy like it's Lent isn't something that I'm, that I am interested in. Like you're a magician, you're a witch, or you're not. There's like, I don't teach part-time magic. Um, but I think within that context, sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if you've just been living it up and not doing any kind of spiritual practice, and now suddenly you want to do some advanced spiritual work, probably good to, to purify and fast and all that. Uh, fasting absolutely has a sublimating effect as well. Literally makes you like, um, you know, and, and, and a wonderful spiritual tool. Um, also has, you know, it also can have negative effects. It can, it can make you uh, a little weaker, uh, either physically or mentally when going in, if you're not used to it. So, on the one hand, you might be more ready to receive, but you might be less ready to handle something going wrong. Um, I tend to view things as like, you know, uh, cost benefit scenarios rather than good, bad, this good, that bad. Like 
everything is has positives and negatives. Like, so what, what's better in this scenario? Um, but for a general offering where you're going outside and, you know, I, like every morning I offer some incense and libation to different classes of spirits. Um, nah, nothing, nothing special. But if you are preparing something for either a single spirit or a single group of spirits, then it might be useful to do some kind of special purification. Uh, a great example would be working with Nagas. Uh, they're notoriously vegetarian spirits. So abstaining from meat and eggs for 24 hours uh, is a good idea. Like that would be something that you would want to do. And I always say like, look, if you're having a party where you're inviting a bunch of people, you put out what you put out. And if the vegan doesn't like that you have, you know, beef out, they don't eat it. They eat the vegan things. But if you have a vegan over for dinner and they're the only guests and you serve steak, then you're an asshole. Like, it's just that simple. So. Yes, that is that is wonderful, uh, magical and culinary advice as well. Jason, in addition to that, in terms of breaking the dichotomy and blurring the lines, we have a listener question for you from patron Sarah. And Sarah is asking, does Jason have any experiences or opinions that he would like to share where spirits have, in essence, blurred the lines between magical systems? For example, Sarah says, if you have spirits of ancestors helping open doors or smooth connections with spirits of an entirely different sort. Sure. So I, yeah, sure. There, there are things that happen because it's real. See, that's the thing that people lose the script on when they get hunkered down into these ideas of mutually exclusive traditions and cultures that are in bubbles that that which is also not real but the idea that like these are the deities of a system and therefore they never ever could cross over to another system uh, or be impacted by or is just it's that's not how anything real works magic too so, you know, like if, if you like, can the guy at the Indian restaurant tell you where to get good Turkish food in town? Yeah, sure. Um, is that like, whoa, he, but he's, he's in an Indian restaurant. He should only know Indian stuff. Whoa. Like, that's silly, right? Like, it's silly to think that way. When in reality, you could eat it both. You don't need to do any kind of paradigm shifting or, 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 or purification before you go from one for lunch and the other for dinner. And then you can bring the leftovers home and, you know, eat your souvlaki in a... Um, in some garlic naan and have fusion, uh, you know, and dump curry all over it if you want. So, you know, the idea that magic somehow are these absolutely mutually exclusive boxes is just, it's not true. It's not silly. It's not how it was ever thought of. Uh, I mean, look at, the the Greek magical papyri for examples of exactly what you're talking about. Um, look at the the different Galderbox in Iceland where they're they're you know Odin and archangels affecting one another. So um, it's it's only recently that we've kind of created these fake ideas of walls that never can be crossed. Um, and the intent was good because the, the, you know, the opposite stream 
extreme, sorry, the opposite extreme is just as bad where like, well, everything is just whatever I think about it. And so if I throw some like nails and herbs in a pot, it's an nganga and I'm a palero. Woo! When in fact, no, those things have meaning, you know, um, but it also doesn't mean that your pot that you just made on your own isn't magic. It's not, it's just not that, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's not neat. It's not tidy. So of course, you know, ancestors uh, can help point you on your way to something that wasn't their religion, just like, you know, my parents bought me a copy of the Red Doorstop Golden Dawn when I was 18 because they knew I was into it. And, you know, hey, here you go. Here's a nice expensive thing that you probably can't afford on your own. And, you know, I, it's a real thing that if people could just remind themselves that like magic is real and behaves like most real things view it as mechanistically as you can rather than the other way. I, I, I recently, uh, my wife had asked me after reading some books, she's like, do you have a mission statement? And I said, no. And I'm like, but if I did, it would be to get normal people to think more magically and magical people to think more normally. Uh, Cause we do get up our own butts sometimes and, and it gets in the way. You know, Jason, to that very theme, which which is so lovely that you're sketching out to, you know, break the t tight, you know, neat little boxes, everything's so tidy. We have two listener questions for you that I think follow exactly what you brought up. And the first is uh, from Lucid Themes, who is asking, could you, Jason, share how your Christian and Western work feeds into your view of God as the supreme consciousness of divinity contrasted with the atheistic Buddhist worldview. I'll be honest. I don't really, I don't have any beliefs about one or the other. Um, so I've, I've, I have, I have let myself off the hook of theology. I, I have uh, come around to a concept that I call the head, heart and hand. Um, and I, I, I grabbed this off of like a New York Times article about communication skills. Um, the head wants to know the facts of how things are, where they are, what they do, um, and precisely what they're made of. And the heart wants to know what things mean and how they feel, how they frame things. And the hand wants to know what's useful. Like, how does this help? How does it fix something? How does it build something? And I think magic and philosophy and religion are really good with the hand and really good with the heart. Uh, when I think about Aristotle and Plato, I think about so many meaningful things. Aristotle's definition of friendship and, and Plato's allegory of the cave, things that we still find useful and meaningful today as, as, as framing and as intellectual tools and, and mental processes. And then I think about the, the questions of the universe that they tried to answer as terms of how things factually exist. And God, did they suck. They were like wrong 100% of the time. Um, and not only were they wrong about everything, but you weren't allowed to say that they were wrong about everything. So we, you know, we couldn't accept ellipses because Plato says circles are perfect. And we couldn't have a heliocentric universe because Aristotle says that the earth is in the center of the solar system. Um, and they're obviously right because they are who they are. And I just, I, I kind of think magic is sucksville at establishing these head questions. Um, I, don't, I don't care about 
whether there's a a god that rules over everything in the Western sense or uh, that things have spontaneously arisen because of an original cause of ignorance in, in, in a chain of interdependent origination. Uh, I would just say that, you know, the Western Eastern thing is not quite correct because there's plenty of Easterners who believe in, in gods and plenty of Westerners like Meister Eckhart who, and, and other contemplatives who have a pretty loose view that God might not be this guy, <laughs> you know? Um, so it's what I am concerned with is what's next. Like where I, I don't care about the final state even of enlightenment or, or salvation. What's next? What's the next step? Where, what direction am I headed? What's the next step to get there? Uh, what what next step opens me up to more possibilities, um, more wisdom, more power? <laughs> uh, and that's really, you know, what I am concerned with. We're, we're, it's like if we're on the East Coast, we can sit and we can argue about what the West Coast is like. And we can develop theories and maps and, uh, but, you know, or we could just set out one foot in front of the other and head West. Right. Exactly. Well, we balance of the two, but, you know, we can look at people that have made the trip and see what they have to say, but then we might find a lot of what they had to say was incorrect or, you know, especially if they did it a long time ago, that they're using models that are not, that we have better models for them, right? Yeah, that's that's a really good point. And, and I know, uh, I believe you've touched on this in the past, that it's it's embedded in the name or the term the occult. It is hidden. There should all, no matter how many veils you rip off the shrine of the occult, there's always another 60 trillion veils that are there just waiting for you to explore, you know? Yeah. And so I, I think, you know, we have this wonderful thing called science and, and I like to let it be science. Um, and the cool thing is science doesn't really try to answer questions of meaning or, or you know, and sometimes it, it touches it's useful, but it doesn't try to be the only useful thing. Um, so you know, when it comes to explaining the definite truth of how the universe works, I always say, look, you know, Alan Rick, uh, is it Alan Rickman? Can come down it as Metatron and, and physically touch me and then break out a whiteboard and show me how exactly the map of heaven works and manifests into reality. And if I don't get anything from that, that's like, okay, and this is meaningful and, and can help us improve and, and comfort us or, or uh, give us tools to think better about the world, then I don't really care because I don't have any way to verify it. Doesn't, you know, some dude appeared out of nowhere. <laughs> And, you know, as well, Jason, in terms of, of, of that, of, you know, finding if it works, keep doing it, find out what's useful. And, and again, not being afraid to, as you say, you know, get rid of the tidy little boxes. We have another listener question for you from Octavian Graves. And Octavian is asking, after creating a devotional relationship with a deity like Hecate, could one Jason invoke her either right before or during a traditional Solomonic evocation of a goetic spirit for added protection? And are there other ways that Hecate can be implemented into traditional Solomonic magic? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, it's been done before. It's been done in the past. Um, and so, yeah, you, you can invoke Hecate as yet another power. There does sort of get to be like a, um, like at a certain point you reach like a saturation 
of like how much crap can we invoke and throw in here that's actually doing something? Like, is it really adding power to have Hikate there? Um, maybe it is. Um, maybe she's filling a gap that isn't filled by those other powers, but maybe not. If it's just a matter of like, well, I've got it, so I'm going to throw at it, then I'm sort of like, maybe not. Like, like why overcomplicate it? Why create more complexity rather than less? You should have a reason for it. Um, so, but yeah, you can. Absolutely. There's, you know, um, there's no reason not to unless your view of Christianity is such that like all other entities are demons and that must be destroyed, then obviously doing that would make no sense. And as well, Jason, uh, you mentioned in the book that with all these different traditions, sometimes, you know, friendly conjuration is needed sometimes, as, as you say, maybe it, it, it's needed to be a little bit bossy. Uh, one thinks of the traditional uh, grimoires, and especially when it comes to things like a charge. We have a, a listener question for you from patron Scott Dilly, who is asking and saying, hello, sir. I have found that a lot of spirit request has to do with the charge. In other words, have the charge carefully worded and with planetary or heptarchical spirits, for example, recited at the right time without deviation. One reason, Scott says, for this being that the actual communion, as far as I can tell, mainly consists of something like a flicker of a candle, a change of temperature, knocking, birds flying by, something happening in the moment. But on the other hand, Scott says... I also hear advice to simply ask the spirits what other abilities they may have, which entails a conversation to one's sensible judgments. Judgments. Would you mind sharing, Jason, some words on the blurry line between the confirmation of a spirit's presence and the point of clear, concise communion? Yeah. So, um, let, so let's talk about this. You know, you're giving the example of planetary spirits who you have called upon to do something related to the, the planetary sphere. So there, the timing matters because you are using the system of either horary astrology or planetary hours and, and days. Um which may or may not be intrinsically impactful on the world, but within this view, within this system, within this uh, piece of magic that's been communicated, that's the tool that you're using, the information that you're going by. And so you're, you're sticking with it. And then you get the result and this resonance, right? That's what the, re you know, you get even more than resonance. You get a little confirmation that that flicker, that something to let you know that the work is done. And that's great. Uh, and that's all that you needed from that. Because ultimately, even if you're setting it up like a full evocation, you're doing a spell. You want something to happen. You want the spirit to do it. And there's not really a reason for the spirit to show up and, and, and you know, like bend over backwards just to do what it does. So it's a separate operation entirely from contacting the spirit and asking what else it can do. Um, so if you want to reach out to a spirit and ask what else it can do, my advice would be, uh, you know, if you're not doing purification rituals, then purify, uh, set up the time to meditate, the time for silence, the, and that includes time after you've said your conjurations to, to mentally reach out, use some of the spirit skills in the book uh, to reach out. Very often there's a spirit there who's, who's like, meeting you 75, 80% of the way, but people are like, 
you know, they, they don't even like, never mind the fact that their senses there can't scry to meet it there. Sometimes people don't even shut up long enough. Like, like, you know, I'm going to read this conjuration and I've read the conjuration for 10 minutes and now I stop. No spirit. Okay. Next. Uh, stop spirit. No. Okay. Next. It's like, dude, it's coming from another dimension. Like, Shut up for a minute. Give it a second. Like, like give, give, give it a second. Um, reach out. Like, use some of the spirit skills. Reach out. Feel. Ask for, you know, if you want to ask, like, a blanket of what can you do. What I like to do is sort of start with what it's been said that the spirit can do. And then branch out from there, maybe ask specific things like, can you also affect computers? Can you also affect, you know, the, the, you know, bureaucracies, uh, things like this. So something that relates to what the work that has primarily been done and that the spirit is known for, even if it's related to the planet, um, Sometimes it could be related to the history of the spirit, even not in the grimoire itself. But, you know, some spirits are, uh, you know, they're, they're older than what the dictionary in for now said about them. So you can look at the history of Astarte and ask Astaroth about things that might be under Astarte's domain. Um, and then, yeah, you, you, you have to sit and be receptive or work with a, with a seer, uh, which has its own troubles at times. Um, and then if you don't get anything, then watch for dreams. Like if you don't get anything that's a very clear communication, well, did you get anything that was a flash, that was an inspiration, that was symbolism? Maybe you should explore that. Maybe you should look for omens. Maybe you should look at dreams that occur. Sometimes spirits that are trying to answer you in the circle, but just you, you know, can't, will speak to you in a dream. Um, so these things happen and then you evaluate it. Is it useful? Is it actionable? Et cetera, et cetera. And then you test it. Because, I mean, the reality is you could get a spirit that says, oh, yeah, 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 I can do that. Turns out not really all that great at doing that after all, even though it said it was. Whereas somebody else, maybe they conjured that planetary spirit of, uh, of you know, of, of Venus, and they didn't get anything big, but when they did a divination to say, can you help me get a promotion at work? They get a positive result. And then they invoke that spirit for the promotion at work and get it. Boom. So there we, there, there can be at times a disconnect or a non-relation between the paranormal psychic experience of communication with the spirit or the feelies or, or phenomena and magical results sometimes. Sometimes people can have these intense rituals that wind up not doing anything. What they were feeling so intensely is all the presence and energy and effort just kind of circulating around having nowhere to go. <laughs> yes. Coming back to that theme that you've touched on, Jason, which is just, is it useful? Does it work? What can I do? What is what is the next step? And um, I, I, I know we have a few listener questions as well that that uh, tie into this theme. And again, coming back to um, an entity you are very familiar with, uh, Hecate. And so we have a, a listener question uh, from patron Jez, who is asking and saying, hi, Jason. First of all, let me say how much I enjoy listening to your interviews with Alex on Glitch Bottle. Oh, thank you, Jez. And, and Jez says, I think your mixture Jason, of hilarity and knowledge brings a great sense of vitality and results in excellent esoteric listening. My question, Jez says, relates to your suggestion of boiled eggs as offerings to Hikate. 
my dog, Dexter, who is black and also sometimes comes and barks and acts weirdly when I'm communicating with Hikate, has been stealing eggs off of the altar. I'm wondering if this is a good thing, Jez says, like the offerings are going directly to the intended source or whether Dexter is just a gobbly guts. I just feed him the eggs now and after three days, but I wonder whether leaving the eggs at a crossroads would be more effective. Thank you, Jez. So, um, you know, it, it comes like, it comes into how I think of things again. Could it be that Hikate is utilizing her dog to consume the eggs? Sure. Could it be that the dog just gobbles the eggs? Sure. Uh, you know, if it was chocolate you were leaving out, I would say, I don't care if it's Hikate, like, don't let your dog eat the chocolate, uh, cause it's not safe for dogs. Eggs are safe for dogs. Um, that said, you know, eating like four eggs every, you know, is, is maybe not the greatest diet for dogs, but, um, leaving them at a crossroads is perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with your dog eating the eggs unless it makes a big mess in your house. Uh, I would just take it as like a sign, a pat on the back, like dogs are related to Hecate. The dog is eating the Hecatean offerings. That's it. I wouldn't read too much into it. I wouldn't then start like, you know, set up a shrine for the dog as like the guardian of like Hecate's representative on earth or anything. Uh, but people do, um, which, you know, that's where I'm sort of like, calm down. Like, it's just, it, it's a thing. It happened. It was cool. You can take it as a pat on the back, but it doesn't mean that you need to, you know, exalt your dog or anything. So, yeah. I mean, it could be, could not be, don't know. Does it matter? Like take it as a pat on the back or take it as just, Hey, that happens. Well, that is definitely just, uh, again, keeping an open mind and, and just being aware of, of, of what's shifting around in the situation is, yes. is excellent. Uh, and Jason, too, uh, speaking of Hikate, uh, we have another listener question for you from JT Lopez, uh, who is saying, Jason, in your book and your website, you frequently emphasize working with Hikate and St. Cyprian. Do you believe there's an, an inherent magical power that is exclusive to these intermediary spirits, or are they perhaps just a medium, an idea for our consciousness to crutch on when performing tasks relevant to the character of these spirits? Maybe another way to ask this question is, do you believe something inherently magical happens when performing evocations in the name of St. Cyprian and Hecate, or... Are these just ways of organizing thought, just as with the Arbitel? If so, then could we theoretically go to the chaos magic route and invoke spirits in the name of Dr. Strange to the same effect as Hecate or St. Cyprian? No. Um, so, no, I, d I don't believe that St. Cyprian or Hecate are just aspects of the mind um, I, they, they are not, they surprise in all sorts of ways. And so, no, they are not just convenient mental constructs to do magic through, um, at all. And that, that goes for most deities. Um, that said, you know, even if that was your view, your own model then winds up poo-pooing the Doctor Strange idea anyway. Because the model of, of these beings being mental constructs where the being isn't important, the belief is important, right? Well, there is no way that, that you can generate belief in Doctor Strange in a way that matches the faith that people have in something that they believe to be real. So I don't care how much chaos, magic, paradigm shifting and sitting there for an hour before your ritual going, I really, really believe. 
believe in Batman. I really believe in Batman. I really believe. I really, really, really believe. You can hype yourself up with attention, but you, your belief, if it was a measurable thing, it, it's never going to match the belief in something that people think is real. And it's never going to match the faith or belief that people who are genuinely devoted to something have. So even by its own rules, the model fails at effectiveness. Like it falls apart at effectiveness. But thankfully, the model is garbage anyway. I don't, I don't think that uh, belief in a thing really affects the results very much at all, in fact. Um, and so, no, I don't hold St. Cyprian or, or Hecate or any other being as, uh, as simply just a construct of your mind. That's not to say that there's no overlap. There's not to say that there's no element of interconnectedness. So, you know, the other extreme is like, well, people like Hecate is real and her name really is Hecate. And like, even if there was no ancient Greece, her name would be Hecate. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, and, and all the attributes that we attribute to her based upon the human culture and mythologies that we know her through, you're telling me she would still have all those. Of course not. But just like us, if we went through, if we were raised in a different place with different experiences, we would be different people. It doesn't mean that we don't exist. So we need to start, we need to stop pigeonholing these beings into these simplistic kindergarten models and, like, if they are more subtle than people, then we should look at people as the level of, like, wow, people are pretty deep and subtle already. So if I'm treating this god as if it's just, like, all one thing, then I'm probably on the wrong track. So, Megamon, think, think bigger, think interconnected... Think that, you know, think, think Rumsfeldian. Think that, you know, there are known knowns and there are known unknowns and there are unknown unknowns. And there's more out there than we know and more out there than we can know. So, you know. You know, Jason, this touches directly on your earlier point about the a need for a mega model. Uh, and yeah. so we, we do have, to that point, another listener question for you from patron Lucid Themes, who is asking and saying, receiving initiations from spirits into their sphere, stealing uh, Frater Aro's terminology, is solid macro scale magic to learn to mediate their powers, though... Lucid is asking, are there any other types of long-term rights, excluding the Abramelin right, that you, Jason, think really highly of? Oh, God. Uh, I mean, there are tons. These, these exist all over. Um, I mean, everywhere in the world. The tantric empowerments and rituals that, that you build the generation stage and then through the completion stage. Um, they're just one example. Um, there are, you know, rites uh, of shamanism related to plants where it's, it's not just going and tripping. There's an ongoing relationship and initiation and ability to uh, traverse realms and mediate powers there. You know, the, the, when you look at... Uh, anyone interested in St. Cyprian should take a look at the role of St. Cyprian in, in like San Pedro shamanism in the mesas uh, that, that the, basically the altars on the ground that, that the shaman use and see how they mediate uh, the powers. So yeah, there's all sorts. Um, 
And I mean, I, I have a respect for, uh, you know, for most magic. I, I, I have a respect for, you know, even brand new things with fake histories. I, I have a respect for Wicca. I have a respect for the Simon Necronomicon. I, I you know, uh, things that other people would just make fun of. Um, because I, you know, I mean, for some people, it's about history is the mark of authenticity. If it's old, then it's true. To me, that's like, we don't do this with anything other than magic. Like, there's nothing like, if I'm going for a medical procedure, I'm like, well, who's got the oldest textbook? That's what I want to know. Like, who's who's got the oldest, most out of date medical procedures? That's what I want, uh, says no one. Um, and then there's an, an idea of cultural authenticity, like whatever is the most culturally authentic. And, and that is really vital to some people and, and less to others. And I think people violate it at, in disrespectful ways and poo poo like disregard it. And I think that's that's bad, just like I think disregarding history is, is bad as well. But then there's also functional authenticity and. Uh, you know, when it comes to functional authenticity, it's not always locked into history or culture. So, you know, Jason, that touches on something that I think a lot of listeners w- will pick up on and have picked up on in, in your courses and your books, which is you have so much experience with these traditions, different traditions, but you also have a lot of depth. And I think that leads to this listener question from patron Casper A. And Casper is asking and saying, hi, Jason, you have a tremendous amount of breadth in your background with exposure to a wide range of traditions. How would you, Jason, say that has informed your engagement with spirits? And do you have any tips for building a practice that is both diverse while also staying authentic? Yeah, um, you know, it's affected my relationship with spirits because I I couldn't view magic through just one lens because I had other lenses available and that my underlying reason for getting involved in magic lies in direct experience before I had any exposure to magical traditions, I had experiences with spirits. So when I get involved in magic, it was with an eye towards that. So there's an underlying reality that supersedes whatever one tradition says. Right. It's not that those traditions are not important or informative. They are deeply so. Um, But it's just like with food again, you know, there are underlying realities of taste and, and, and like, you know, salt, sweet, savory. I forget what the fourth one is, but um, you know, but uh, Every cult, every culinary tradition plays with those same fundamental tastes. Um, And so that's part of it. Now, as for the advice as to how to tackle it, it would be to go a little slower than you can at this point. And I have to stress that this is a little different than the advice that I would have given when I was coming up because the problems today are different. When I was coming up, there was not a lot of information. There was no, the market wasn't flooded with magical books. Um, we had comparatively little and we had to seek it out and, and find whatever we could. So I just, you know, I grew up in central New Jersey and I found anyone that could talk about magic at all. And before I was 21, that led me to befriend uh, a Nakba, John Mearden Reynolds, 
uh, it led me to, to befriend a root worker, uh, a Santero, uh, a, a Rosicrucian teacher, and then eventually, uh, you know, a, a Wiccan and, and some Thalamites. And um, I had to, with the idea that all this is real, that there's an underlying reality, I had these traditions to dig into and engage with and people to talk to. Um, and then over time, you know, you get your driver's license and the internet gets invented and you can get out and learn a lot more, a lot faster. But now you're in an age of, in, of both information saturation and misinformation. It's like somebody took the library of Alexandria and said, here's all the information that was in it, but we're going to take it and we're going to rip it all up and we're going to hide it in a hundred thousand other books. <laughs> you, you like, so your issue is to go less fast than you can. Like if you see something that catches your eye and you get a book about it, then take a little while, months, years to dig in rather than, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was interested in Kimbanda for a couple of weeks and now I saw this. Uh, you know, I saw a, a movie about Kathmandu. So now I'm going to start researching that. Now I'm going to start researching this. And now I'm going to start researching this. I might have been utterly lost in today's world if I, if I came up because I was so hungry. Um, so you have better information, but it's hidden amongst a lot of misinformation and then just a lot of redundant information. And people that have built these walls that are like, well, we're over here and they're over there. And never the twain shall meet. Whereas when I was coming up, anybody interested in magic was interested in anybody at all that was interested in magic. So you'd sit in a room with Lukumi practitioners and people from the Temple of Set and people from the OTO and the Golden Dawn and, and Wiccans. And you'd all figure out what you could do together. So um, just take it a little slow, be respectful. Uh, you know, if you, if you learn something, give credit where credit is due. Uh, you know, I'm always saying, you know, when I picked this up here and I learned this from so-and-so and yeah, be respectful. Don't misrepresent a tradition. Uh, you know, if you do something that deviates or even just like completely is like, I grabbed this and now I'm going into like weirdo wacko sorcerer land. Say, I grabbed this idea from there, but it's not this thing. You shouldn't think of it as this thing. But people do the opposite, don't they? they they're they like, oh, yes, this is voodoo. When it, like, no, it's not. <laughs> like, it's not that anybody would recognize <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's such an incredibly valuable uh, perspective just to keep that in mind about the flow of information. And, and frankly, that's one of the excellent things I really enjoy about consorting with spirits is it, it takes this very vast um, menagerie of information and it, and it presents it in a way that it's very accessible. And I think Jason, uh, that leads to one of the last questions about the book. I definitely want to get into your, your future projects. Um, but what else should people keep in mind when they first pick up a copy of your book or they keep working through consorting with spirits? What are some of the two or three big things that you just want them to remember? Yeah, you know, um, keep, in, keep the idea that, like, use people as, like, relationships with people and the way people are as your model for how to treat spirits, how to form relationships with spirits, whether it's likely that a spirit would, would like harm you or something, right? Like there are some people out there, they're just like, oh, well, I asked Hecate to bless this talisman on the dark of the moon. And then the next morning, I stubbed my toe. So clearly she hates me and I'm cursed. And, you know, no, like if, you know, no, no, that's not likely at all. And um, 
And, and unfortunately, there will be a hundred people there going, yes, yes, she does. She hates you. And now you must cleanse and follow my, you know, and then, you know, like I will cleanse her for you. And uh, so, yeah, just, you know, get a little grounded. Think a little mechanically about magic. Think about spirits as if they are people. And think about people as if they are spirits, that um, they are not as independent we are not as independent as as we sometimes think we are very interdependent um and you know realize too that you should have some ability to protect yourself if something goes wrong but you shouldn't like let fear rule you like things don't go wrong all the time as a rule but some people just think that they do like magic somehow is good enough to get you in trouble, but not good enough to get you out. The, the, the summoning works, but not the dismissal. Um, but, and that's horror movie thinking. It's not real. Authentic, magical thinking, keeping it practical and, and really not being afraid to experiment and to try new things. That is such incredible advice. And I, I really hope that uh, the listeners appreciate it as much as I do. And uh, make sure to check out the video and podcast descriptions below to um, get your own copy of Jason's book, Consorting with Spirits. But Jason, you're always busy working on something. And I think that this uh, next and last uh, listener question from patron Lucid Themes really encapsulates this. And Lucid is saying, I was waiting for this episode after finishing Jason's book just last week. Hi, Mr. Miller. With this latest book out and your upcoming Arcane Audio on the Mechanics of Magic, do you, Jason, have any other plans that you could share for what is coming next? Oh, well, um, you know, uh, it's, it's summer and I do have, I can't, I have plans that I'm working on, but I can't share. Them. So there may be a book sooner than usual. There's usually my books come out like two, three years apart. Um, there might be a book sooner than that, but I can't talk about it too much yet. Um, and it's summertime. So I'm just trying to keep, keep, the classes I have going and enjoying life in the summer and uh, promote this book for now. And, you know, there'll probably be another arcane audio here and there. They, those, those classes, you can find them all on my website with uh, there's an archive of all the arcane audios. Now I think there's 27 of them, but you know, those are things that like, they don't fit anywhere else. Like I get an idea of like, I want to give a class in this. It's, like it's deeper than a blog post, but not a book or a course, but I can devote three hours one night talking with it. So I give these occasional Zoom classes um, and yeah, so all the recordings are up. So Mechanics of Magic, I think went pretty well. Awesome. Awesome. Well, definitely make sure to check out the uh, podcast and video description uh, to uh, check out Jason's website, as well as his latest book to pick up your own copy is called Consorting with Spirits. And I know that uh, the patrons of the podcast will be enjoying a little bit of an after show, but for the main part of the podcast, uh, practicing magician, author, strategic sorcerer, Jason Miller, as always, thank you just so, so much for, for taking the time and joining us on the podcast today. Oh, thank you for having me. It was a real pleasure. Thank you.